Hi, welcome. I guess the first thing I should say is that the official name of the talk is Yoga for Pain Relief rather than yoga for pain. And I think when, you know, when we, we think about uh, popular stereotypes of yoga, yoga for pain, that kind of uh, no pain, no gain, twisting into horrible postures and having to stay there, and uh, this is really gonna be something very different than that, yoga for pain relief. And so I wanna start by giving you a direct experience of how simple yoga for pain relief can be. So we're gonna do a very short practice here that really includes all of the healing elements of yoga, and you don't need to even leave your chair. But you do need to make yourself as comfortable as you can in the chair that you're in. So take a moment and, and think about how you're sitting. I'm gonna ask yourself, am I really sitting in the way that's gonna make my body feel most comfortable? And you may find that perching at the end of the chair feels a little bit better, or maybe sliding all the way back with your hips and leaning back with a straight spine feels good. Maybe legs uncrossed feels good, feet on the floor. And then let your hands rest somewhere that feels comfortable on the arms of your chair or on the lap. And then we're gonna release a little bit of tension in the shoulders and the neck. So on an inhalation, take your shoulders up to the ears if they're not already there. And exhale, drop them down. So we're gonna do that four more times. And exhale through the mouth. Inhale through the nose. Exhale. Let the shoulders drop. And again, a few more times. And one more time, letting go of any unnecessary tension, not just in the shoulders, but in the whole body. Great. And now, either close your eyes or choose a single spot to focus at. And that could be at your hands in front of you, wherever's most comfortable. And begin now just to notice the fact that you are already breathing. This is not something you have to add to what is happening, but already you're breathing. So notice when you breathe in and when you breathe out. And notice that sometimes, just when we turn our attention to the breath, it kind of slows down a little bit, maybe relaxes a little bit. And as I guide you now on a brief breathing exercise, know that you don't really need to breathe in any special way. There's nothing you need to change. It's more of a breathing visualization than a breath control exercise. So let's begin by inhaling through the nose and exhaling through the mouth again, but with a really soft exhale, just kind of opening the jaw and letting the breath escape. Close the mouth as you breathe in. And exhale, part the lips, easy breath out. We'll take a few more breaths in this way, feeling the cool breath move into the body and relaxing tension in the face as you breathe out. Sensing the movement of breath in through the nose and the mouth and the throat. An easy letting go of the breath. Now close the mouth. Take a few breaths here. And I'd like you to bring your awareness to the ears, to your ears. And see if you can imagine or maybe even sense your ears, the outer ears, and your inner ears. Imagine or even sense that ear canal from the outer ear to the inner ear. And imagine that space extending into the nose and into the throat. And for a few breaths, I'd like you to imagine, just imagine, because if you can actually do this, that'll be quite incredible. Imagine that you can inhale through your ears and then open the mouth and exhale. And take a few breaths in this way and be kind of playful with this idea. Imagine that you could inhale through the ears, open the mouth and exhale, release. Two more breaths in this way, inviting the healing breath in through the ears and out through the mouth. One more breath. And then again, closing the mouth 
and feeling the relaxation of the whole face, feeling the forehead soften and the muscles around the eyebrows and eyes relax, feeling the muscles of the jaw relaxed and the skin of the whole face soften. Again, you can keep your eyes closed or choose a spot to focus at. We're going to continue to inhale and exhale through the nose. But drop our awareness down into the core of the body, into your belly. You might even place a hand on your belly if you like. And notice that there's already some movement happening here. As you breathe in, there may be some gentle expansion happening around the belly. And start to notice that gentle expansion around the belly, or perhaps you feel it more in the ribs. And notice what it feels like when that expansion dissolves. Notice what it feels like when the body expands with the breath. Notice what it feels like when the expansion dissolves on the exhale. And I'd like you to notice for yourself if you feel a little more expansion at like the belly button, the belly itself, or if you feel a little more of the expansion up around the chest and your physical lungs. Both are good. Just ask yourself, where do I really feel that sensation of getting bigger when I breathe in? Chest, upper ribs, or belly? And if you aren't sure, placing a hand on both the center of the chest and the belly can give you some real feedback about what's happening in the body. And you may feel a little bit of movement underneath the skin of your hand. And when you have a sense of where that expansion is taking place, relax your hands back by your side or on your lap. And now imagine that you could inhale and exhale directly from that spot of expansion. So imagine inhaling and exhaling directly from the navel, or imagine inhaling and exhaling directly from the center of the chest. What would it feel like if you could breathe in through this spot and then expand the belly with breath or expand the lungs and heart with the breath? And with this visualization, inviting the core of the body, the belly, the chest, even the back, to relax. And then keep a soft awareness of how it feels to breathe. And we'll take one more practice here. I'd like you to bring to mind something that is going well with your physical body, something that is healthy, something that is functioning well. It could be anything at all, including the breath, the breath that you just witnessed. And take a moment to notice something that you are grateful for in your own body and your own health. And rest for a few moments in that sense of gratitude or appreciation for your body. And then when you're ready, open your eyes if they're closed and maybe move or stretch a little bit. Anything that would bring the body back into this moment, especially if you fell asleep. Take a little twist or anything else that would feel good. Say hello to your neighbor. And any time that you need to, to take care of your own needs in this talk, we're going to go about 45 minutes or so, I think. Uh, there's at least a women's restroom on that side and some water to drink. Anything else that you need, you know, feel free to take care of. So welcome. That was pretty much everything you need to know about yoga for pain relief, just in that little short practice. You know, someone had asked, actually a few people asked me when I arrived here if I was going to be on the floor demonstrating all sorts of interesting yoga poses. 
you know, we could do that. But that's such a small part of what yoga is. Yoga is really a, a system of self-care that includes movement and postures, and some are kind of funny looking, and some are kind of difficult. And that's this tiny sliver of what yoga is. And the yoga for pain relief, the yoga for healing, really draws from the much um, broader, richer, diverse set of yoga practices and philosophy. And so what we did just now, you befriended your body. You made some conscious choices. You listened to your body. You tried to make yourself a little bit more comfortable, try to listen to what was needed. That's a really big uh, part of yoga for pain relief, befriending the body and listening to the body. We did a little bit of movement up and down with the idea of relaxing tension in the body. And so movement and relaxation are important parts of a yoga practice for pain relief, but they don't have to be really complicated. There are always movements that one can do, no matter how restricted your range of motion is. Uh, and we also did a little bit of breathing and meditation, which are the other uh, two key components. So befriending the body, movement and relaxation, meditation and breathing. And within that set, there's always something that can improve your experience in this moment, even if pain or stress or other difficult emotions are present. And so while I'll be focusing mostly on physical pain today, pretty much everything that I say today would also apply to things like grief and depression and anxiety and anger and other forms of emotional pain. Um, because as science and the yoga tradition is now telling us, uh, that there's really not a clear and dividing line between physical pain and emotional pain. So just to get a sense of who's here today, I know that many of you are here because you yourself have some issues around pain because of injuries or illnesses or chronic conditions. Is there anyone who's here because you work with people in pain? Anyone? A few? Great. Okay. And anyone here not because you yourself are dealing with pain but because a loved one is and you kind of are, are looking for uh, ways to offer compassion and care? Anyone? Okay, you may find yourself in that situation. Uh, and anyone here just because you love yoga or teach yoga? Great, good. Front row. That's, uh, <laughs> and back. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, so I kind of fall into all of those categories myself. I'm a health psychologist um, at Stanford University, and I teach health improvement through the uh, Stanford School of Medicine. And I also am someone who's dealt with a, a variety of chronic pain issues over my life. And my experience has been that yoga can completely get rid of some chronic pain conditions. For example, chronic back pain that's related to stress or tension or posture. And my experience has been my chronic back pain went away completely with yoga. And I've also found that other types of chronic pain, uh, they don't necessarily get cured or go away, uh, but they become much easier to deal with. Uh, they, they can become sort of less the defining condition of your life experience. And in, in my experience, uh, so sort it of came to yoga with 20 years of chronic headaches, daily headaches. Uh, and even though those headaches aren't exactly gone, they're much less severe, they're much less frequent, and they, uh, they really don't um, control my life in the way that they used to before I found yoga and mindfulness practices. Uh, and I think that this is something that I can offer to you uh, with, pretty, with, with some confidence, that there are some things yoga can completely cure and remove certain amounts of pain. And then there are other conditions, and some of you may have been dealing with your chronic pain for a long period of time. There are many conditions where the pain doesn't exactly go away, but the suffering is relieved tremendously. And so we'll think of both of those as being the, the promise of yoga, the cure, but also the relief of suffering. Um, so the agenda for tonight is to say a little bit more about pain, the nature of pain, and chronic pain in particular, and then think about how yoga can help. And then we're going to finish with another set of practices, a little bit more drawn out um, version of what we did at the, the beginning of this talk. And the reason that I wrote this book, Yoga for Pain Relief, is because in my experience working with people who have chronic pain due to illnesses or injuries um, or stress, is that people have a lot of misconceptions about the nature of pain and also about yoga. And so the idea is that uh, you know, when you start to understand what causes pain and the complexity of pain, it becomes a little bit more clear how many avenues there are for healing beyond the things that often don't work, like pain medications or surgeries. Uh, so I want to start here with this idea the, about the nature of pain. In the last decade or so, uh, modern medicine and science has pretty much shifted its whole conception of what pain is. We used to think about pain as being a sensation in the body 
much like uh, what you hear is a sensation and what you see is a sensation and what you taste is a sensation. And we thought that pain was just the readout of what was happening in the body. Uh, and, and it's a good readout of what's happening in the body so that you know, if you're feeling a certain amount of pain, you can trust that there's something wrong in the body in the way that when you see something, you can trust that there's some, some real object in front of you that you're seeing. And as it turns out, pain is not really a sensation, but it's a complex, protective mind-body response that includes physical sensation, but also includes just as strongly a set of emotions and emotional responses to perceived physical sensation, as well as changes in thought and behavior. And I'm sure that you've experienced this yourself with your pain, where you detect some sort of pain in the body. There's a sensation that comes in from the body through the nervous system to the brain, and that hurts. But as soon as you notice that hurt, it actually kicks into gear a whole bunch of other things, like anxiety about whether it's going to get worse and what does it all mean. Or anger, you know, if you've ever screamed something out when you're in pain, uh, that's part of the pain response. Maybe sadness about what the pain is restricting in your life. There's a whole complex set of emotions that go along with the physical sensation. And they aren't sort of like these afterthoughts or the, the aftershocks of pain, but they're actually an intimate part of the pain response. And they happen almost immediately with the physical sensations. And along with that are thoughts. So when the, the pain sensations make it to the brain, they kind of hijack a lot of the systems in your brain that um, are sort of telling you what to pay attention to. So when the pain sensations come in, your attention gets immediately pulled to those sensations. It becomes really difficult to concentrate on something else or think about other things. We become really vigilant to the pain, that the brain wants to listen to signs that something is going wrong in the body. And so it can be like the loudest thing in our attention or in our environment, the pain signal. And then we also start to try to problem solve. So we try to understand what's causing the pain. We're strategizing what we're gonna do about the pain. We're thinking about what this pain might mean for our future. And there are all these stories that we start to tell ourselves and questions we try to answer. And again, this is not some sort of after thing that we've learned, but this is part of the protective pain response that the, that initial sensation triggers this very complex response that is designed to help you take care of yourself, that is designed to be a, a way to respond to threats. And so you can imagine why, uh, why this could be useful you know, for your survival. When something's actually a threat, it's good to feel really bad about it and to want to figure out how to protect yourself. Uh, and so in some situations, this protective pain response works really well for us. But in the case of chronic pain, uh, this, this uh, sort of instinctive response for most people has become overlearned and overprotective. So that part of that process is completely out of whack with the reality of what's happening in your body. Uh, and there are many ways that this can happen. But, this is, but uh, this is sort of the new thinking on chronic pain that it, for, for many people, has nothing to do with the amount of damage in the body. That chronic pain can linger after an initial injury has healed or an illness has improved, and yet the pain doesn't necessarily get better. Um, and that's because for many of us, after an accident or an illness or a particularly stressful life experience, the, the body and the brain are learning from that experience to try to protect yourself from experiencing that again in the future. Um, and to understand how this works, it can be helpful to think about how the body and the brain learn from all of our experiences. So many of you have probably um, learned a musical instrument in your lifetime? Yes, many of you. Uh, and so there's evidence showing that when you learn a musical instrument, the whole brain and body changes in response to that experience so that you will get better at listening to music. There's evidence that people who train in music literally hear music differently. They hear things that other people can't hear because of their knowledge and their experience. The brain also changes in response to musical training. You know, you, the, the part of the brain that sends sensory information to different sides of the brain gets, actually gets bigger and better connected so that you can uh, become more exquisitely tuned into music or producing music. And even the areas of the brain that are necessary to do fine motor movements, if you're playing the piano or playing the guitar, those areas of the brain get bigger and better connected and more refined as well. So your whole system is kind of improving in a way, learning from your experience. 
And the same thing happens when you exercise. For those of you who have ever done weightlifting, you know that after you, you know, lift some weights, your muscle changes, it gets bigger. You grow new blood vessels to help feed the muscle what it needs in order to do that activity. Now these are all really great examples of plasticity, of how the body adapts to experience. Uh, and unfortunately, pain often triggers the same process of plasticity, that you have a certain experience with pain, and the body and the brain learn that this is a real threat that we need to protect ourselves against, and so we're gonna get really, really good at listening for that threat. And uh, some of the ways that that can show up in your body and in your brain uh, let's imagine that you had a back injury. You had a back injury 10 years ago. And that back injury, maybe it healed in a sense. Maybe you know, the disc is healthy or the muscle injury healed. Uh, but for many of us, the muscles of the back that needed to kind of tighten to protect ourselves in that moment of injury, those muscles learn it may be useful to stay tense. And so we may be now predisposed to muscle tension and the pain that that creates. The, uh, the sensory neurons around those muscles and in the spine may also have decided that it'd be really useful if we could send up information about what's happening in the back a little more quickly. And so your sensory neurons, the pain receptors in the muscles and in the, the joints around the spine can actually become more sensitive to any sign of pressure or inflammation or even healthy movement. And those pain receptors may have decided we're gonna send up anything we notice just in case it's a threat, and that's received in the brain as pain. So things that, were, that aren't really a threat to the health of the body start to be registered by the brain as pain, and that's real pain. It's not like the, oh, it's all in your head pain. It's real pain coming from pain receptors in your body, but it's not necessarily a true signal about danger in the body or injury in the body. And the brain can also change in a way to get better at listening to those signals. Uh, so that you know, there may be a part of the brain that's always going to be vigilant for, for that particular type of pain, whatever it is that you've experienced. And most of us tend to be vulnerable to a specific type of pain rather than all types of pain, whether it's headaches or joint pain or back pain or chronic fatigue. Uh, and the, so the last thing that I'll throw out as a, a process of this plasticity is that when, uh, when pain goes from being acute pain to chronic pain, often those other two components of the pain process that I mentioned, besides the sensation, the emotions and the thoughts, uh, they can trigger the whole pain response. So that if you're having a really bad day at work or you have a fight with a loved one or you didn't get enough sleep and you're feeling really cranky and tired, that emotional state or that conflict can actually trigger the process of inflammation in the body and tension in the muscles and making the sensory receptors, the pain receptors, listen even more for signals that something is going on in the body that, that would be a threat. And essentially anything that you might experience as a threat, whether it's a social threat, a threat at work, uh, something stressful in a relationship, anything can trigger this protective response that was meant to handle physical threats. And so many people with chronic pain find that their mood can be uh, as, as much of a trigger for worsening of a pain episode than something like overdoing it at the gym or whatever we might think of as being physical risks for pain. Uh, and this sounds, this, I know this sounds like bad news. Probably some of you are thinking, oh, aha, that explains a few things. But sometimes when we first hear this, um, this new research, it can feel like, well, great, this means that now I've got a body and a brain that has decided that I'm gonna be in pain. Uh, and the good news is that plasticity works in both directions. So what the, the brain and the body learn in one direction, they can learn in the other direction or unlearn. Uh, and that's basically what yoga is. It's a set of tools of neuro, uh, neuroplasticity and uh, change for the body, changing the body, the way that it moves, the way that it holds tension, and its overall state of health. Um, and so no matter what the body and brain have learned about pain, it's possible to, to unlearn and move in a positive direction. And that's really what's needed for most cases of chronic pain. And of course, there are, there are causes of chronic pain where there's, there's something seriously wrong with the body. You know, cancer pain, for example, that's real. Uh, and it may be related to some of the processes that I just described, but that's a little bit different than the type of chronic pain that I've been talking about. And the, the practices that I'll be describing 
actually are quite useful for even those types of pain, pain that is acute or pain that is related to, to a, a disease state in the body that is very real and very present now. Um, and just be clear that, uh, that the, the chronic pain changes I'm talking about are more related to the everyday types of chronic pain that we deal with, including IBS and arthritis and autoimmune disorders and everyday back pain and headaches and that kind of thing. Um, so I think, uh, let me just say a few more words about how yoga can be helpful and then we'll get to the practices. So I mentioned earlier that there are these kind of five core sets of yoga practices. There's the, the practice of breathing, meditation, movement, uh, relaxation, and befriending the body. And most people have heard of the first four in, co in the context of yoga. And this idea of befriending the body is sometimes new, sometimes new. Um, but yoga comes with it, not just these practices and tools, but kind of a set of philosophy and ideas about who we are as human beings. And one of those big ideas is that, um, that we choose to focus on what is healthy and what is, what is working as much as we choose to focus on what is not working, what is unhappy and painful. Uh, and so this is part of the idea of befriending the body. Many times when we're sick or we have chronic pain, all we can really focus on is how our body has betrayed us, how our body isn't what it used to be, how our body is getting in the way of the life that we were meant to live, certainly all things that I've thought and felt many times. Um, and that experience in itself is a big part of the suffering of chronic pain. And so yoga philosophy suggests uh, it can be very useful just to remember that your body is, is kind of your home and that it, it's nice to be friends with it since we're, we're not going to escape it in this lifetime. Uh, it will be with us the whole journey and has been. And so befriending the body can mean things like remembering what's good and what's working. It can mean things like choosing to care for the body with what you eat and how you sit and getting enough sleep and all of that. So uh, we'll do a little practice at the end for thinking about how you might befriend your body. But I just wanted to say a little more about that since it's uh, a little bit beyond the stereotype of yoga as sort of sitting around meditating or, or moving and stretching. Um, and so... So let's do, a little, let's do a little practice now. Have you been sitting for too long? Do you need to stand up? I see some yeses. Okay, good. Well, then you know. Some of you, maybe you just want to stay where you are. If you want to stand up, stand up for a moment. Do a little stretch or just shake out the body a little. Hmm. Okay, and so the first practice that I'm going to introduce is mindfulness, basic mindfulness. Uh, and I'm going to have a seat with you for this. So go ahead and have a seat again and make it, make it you know, the most supportive position for your body that you can. How many of you are familiar with the practices of mindfulness, have taken like a mindfulness-based stress reduction class or something like that? Good, okay. Well, then this is a treat then to get to introduce this, uh, actually I'll stand up for a little while, yeah, introduce this concept to many of you. Uh, mindfulness is the process of paying attention to what's happening while at the same time practicing not freaking out about what is happening, which is a really, really useful skill for pain and for stress. So it's basically a willingness to, to notice what's happening, to feel it, to sense it, to see it, to hear it, and yet at the same time uh, tapping into your inner calm or the sense that everything is okay as it is. And usually the way that we tap into that, that ability not to freak out is the breath. So we're going to do a mindfulness practice uh, that is essentially just witnessing the breath and choosing to focus our attention on the breath and noticing how the mind often gets pulled away from that center of the breath. And then from that, we're going to practice doing that with a little bit of movement and a little bit of stretching. And hopefully we'll be able to find a stretch for you that's going to feel really good to your body right now. Okay, so to begin with this idea of basic mindfulness of the breath, again, you can close your eyes or focus your gaze and I'm not going to be doing anything interesting. So, I mean, you, you're welcome to stare at me if you like, but there's no show for this part. So you feel free to close your eyes. And if you're worried about falling asleep, sometimes gazing just down at your lap can be helpful. And let's begin just by noticing again the fact that you're breathing. Notice if there's any part of you that thinks, okay, now I have to breathe in a certain way. 
And you don't need to. You can just let the breath happen. Let the body be breathed. And let's label the breath as a way of helping the mind settle into the breath. So when you breathe in, say in your mind, inhale. And when you breathe out, say in your mind, exhale. And let's take a few more breaths like this. Inhale and exhale. And I'm going to start to guide you on a tour of your breath. My prediction is that at some point on this tour, you'll find that you're also thinking about something else. And so you have sort of two tasks with this meditation. Try to stay with the breath and the tour of the breath that I'll be guiding, but also notice when your mind goes somewhere else, when you're thinking about, you know, when is this going to be over? And now I really like to change my position and what I did today. When your mind goes there, just notice and remember the breath. So let's take a tour of four qualities of the breath. And the first quality of the breath is the pace of your breath. The breath can be fast. It can be slow. Don't worry about making it slower or making it faster, but just settle into a sense of awareness about how the breath feels. Perhaps the inhalation is a little faster than the exhalation. Perhaps they're of even length. And perhaps the exhalation is a little bit faster than the inhalation. Just having a natural sense of the rhythm or the pace of your breath. And the next quality of the breath that we can attend to is the texture of the breath. The breath can be smooth or the breath can be kind of bumpy. See if you can feel the flow of the breath in and out of your nose, your mouth, and your throat. And notice this texture of the breath. Is it smooth? Kind of like a steady hand pouring a pitcher of water into a glass? Or does it feel a little bit more bumpy, like a very nervous hand or a very young child trying to pour water into a glass? And you might even let your mind rest for a few breaths on the image of the steady hand pouring smoothly into the glass. And the next quality of the breath that we attend to is the sense of space in the breath. The only way that a breath happens is when the lungs expand. And for the lungs to expand, something has to happen in your body to stretch the lungs bigger. This space or this shape change could happen in your chest. It could happen in your rib cage. It can happen in your belly. But in some way, the body gets a little bit bigger when you breathe in. And in some way, the body relaxes into its shape as you exhale. See if you can feel where this space is being created when you breathe without having to force the space to be bigger. Notice what is already present. Notice what expands when you breathe in. I 
And the last quality of the breath we can attend to is the sense of effort or ease. Sometimes it's harder to breathe. Sometimes there's some real effort or congestion or tension in the breath. And sometimes it's easier to breathe. There's more sense of being breathed than working to breathe. Just notice for yourself how this dimension feels in this moment. And with all of these things to attend to, the pace of your breath, the feeling of the flow of your breath in the nose, the mouth, and the throat, the feeling of expansion or space in the breath, or the quality of ease of the breath, I want you to pick one that you're going to rest your focus on for about 10 to 15 breaths, just a minute or two. Pick one that you would like to focus your attention on, and let's give that a try. Notice where your mind is. Let's give it a few more breaths, focusing on that particular quality of the breath. One more breath. And if your eyes are closed, open your eyes with a soft gaze. And again, check in with your body. If anything is feeling a little bit stiff from having been still in this way, or if anything else is needed, feel free to take a little movement or stretch. And before we take that practice into a movement or stretch, Tell me what you noticed about the practice, anything at all. What did you notice about that practice? It it almost put you to sleep, is that? Yeah, yeah, so this is what we would consider sort of a primary benefit uh, for for many of us. Um, You know, when when you're in pain, sometimes going to sleep is actually the hardest thing in the world. And uh, although I didn't intend to put you all to sleep right now, putting on a, a track like this or leading yourself uh, on a practice like this uh, can actually be very useful in being able to fall asleep because it tends, shifting our attention to the breath tends to both relax the body, slow down the heart rate a little bit, lower the blood pressure a little bit, relax muscle tension, but it also helps shift attention away from the thoughts that can can keep us up or uh, away from that kind of vigilance to whatever pain is present. Yeah, so sometimes it makes us a little sleepy. What else? Um, I wasn't staring at that spot anymore. I mean, I was still looking at it, but I didn't see yeah. it anymore after a while. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. The attention shifted more to what you're feeling in your body. So this is the observation that even though her eyes were still open and they were focused at a spot, somehow her attention was captured by what was happening inside. Yeah, am I getting that? And this is, again, it, it's one of the things that is quite useful about this type of mindfulness practice, that we can learn to choose the focus of our attention rather than having our, our mind and our mindset and and state of emotions be completely controlled by external events or distractions or even something like pain. Um, And so with this, we're training the ability to say, here's here's what I'm focusing on and become sort of less less listening for other things. So just like your eyes stopped listening as much to what you were seeing, this process in the same way can actually help pain receptors in the body stop listening as hard to, uh, to discomfort in the body. And you were going to add something. Yes. 
Uh, so this is the observation that the hands got warm. Uh, this is, that's a very uh, astute observation. So when we're in a, uh, a state of a little bit of stress or a little bit of tension, the blood tends to leave the extremities and go a little bit more to the organs of the body, um, both as sort of a natural part of the stress response and also as a, so the body uh, needs energy to sort of do that stress uh, or have that, that kind of tense feeling. And when we relax the blood, often the blood flow increases to our extremities, to the surface of the skin and to the hands and feet. So that can sometimes be a sign that the body was shifting into a really relaxed state. Thinking. Yeah, stop thinking. And yet, were you aware of the breath? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it was that the mind just decided what it wanted to think about. Yeah. And all the other stuff kind of... Yeah, I was a noisy mind. I tell myself to shut up a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hard. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a really good observation, too. This is the observation that uh, we, we can tell the mind to shut up, and yet that doesn't work. And that's one of the key things about mindfulness is that rather than fighting with what we don't want to think about or fighting with what we don't want to feel, we just chose to shift the attention to something else. The breath is really good because it has a feeling, it has all these different qualities to it, and it also has the benefit of of creating a little relaxation. But often when when we just tell ourselves to stop thinking about something or stop noticing something, that actually uh, triggers a paradoxical response where it becomes even louder and even stronger. Gosh, there's a whole, there's a whole um, area of neuroscience research about why the brain does that. But it's definitely true that what we resist gets louder. Yes? I found, well, I was focusing on a push pin. Mm-hmm. And um, but I found that um, my mind would wander, and then I would have to bring it back. Mm-hmm. It was conscious yeah. that it was wandering, almost as if I were falling asleep and starting to go into a dream straight yeah. state and then have to bring it back. Yeah, yeah, and this is great. That's the, the noticing of what the mind is doing and that part of your mind that can choose to shift it back to what you've chosen to attend to, that's like a muscle that, that we try to build with, in yoga and in meditation practices. Uh, and it's an extremely useful skill to notice. I keep getting hooked by this story or I keep getting hooked by this feeling or this sensation, or my mind is just going you know, all over the place, and I can choose to bring it back here instead of getting hooked and carried away. So what I want to have you do now is, oh, and so by the way, one thing I, I forgot to say that uh, sometimes is not obvious when you first start with this technique is if you noticed your mind wandering, you did very well because the mind always wanders. And sometimes we have this uh, stereotype about meditation that it's about emptying the mind or perfect focus, when actually it's very much cultivating the skill of noticing what the mind is doing and that you have a say in it. So if you notice the mind wandered a lot, you did very, very well with that meditation, not as we often assume very, very poorly. Okay, so we're going to try to do that same meditation in a stretch for a little while, and you may find that you want to come out of it and come back into it. And I'm going to just offer you a bunch of things that might feel good to your body. And you're going to pick the one that feels the best, not the worst. Sort of, you know, practice befriending the body. So here's a possible stretch where you are. Drop one ear to your shoulder and just kind of notice what happens when you do that. You'll probably feel something in the side of the neck, into the shoulder, the chest, maybe into the jaw. If that triggered real pain for you to do that, come out of it. And let's all come out of it. So if that was like, whoa, not good, don't come back to that. If that was like, oh, that was kind of good, I wanted to do the other side, good, then maybe that's your stretch. Now you might try taking your hands in front of you and kind of clasping the hands and pressing the arms out. And you could even drop the chin a little bit. Anyone feeling a stretch? Yeah? Where are you feeling it? Call it out. Shoulders, arms. Neck, wrists, fingers, back. Okay, so relax that. If there's a part of you that was like, "Mm, no, actually I would have liked to stay there a little longer, good, maybe that's your stretch. Uh, Another one, I think you have the room for this with your neighbors, would be to turn to one side and hold on to the sides. I don't know if you guys can see me. So I'm going to keep my legs facing forward, and I'm going to turn to my chair and put put one hand on the other side and the other hand toward the back. And that can be uh, quite a stretch for the belly, for the back, for the chest. 
And you could even let the head turn to look at the person behind you. Okay, and then go ahead and come out of that. So if that felt good, that might be a stretch. Uh, do we need any more? Anyone find that all three of them felt awful? <laughs> Sometimes they do. Any, do we have? Okay. So something of that felt kind of interesting. Good. Okay, so, so before you come into it, and if it has two sides, we'll, you'll get to do both sides. Um, if you choose this one, I'll give you a reverse one when we switch sides. So we're going to come back into this, and I want you to take the first couple of breaths to try to make yourself more comfortable. And sometimes that just means noticing, oh, I put some tension in my face or my shoulders or my hands, and I'm just going to try to try to be as easy in the stretch as possible rather than fight the stretch as much as, like, not like any of this stuff. Um, just you know, the most relaxed way you can be there. And then once you're pretty sure that you're as relaxed as you can be there, we're going to shift the attention back to whatever quality of the breath you found most appealing to focus on. So you can either notice the rhythm of the breath, inhale, exhale. You can notice the texture of the breath, maybe even trying to breathe kind of smoothly. Or you can focus on the feeling of expansion or relaxation of the breath. Okay, so when you're ready, go ahead and take your stretch, either dropping ear to shoulder and relaxing the arms, taking a little back stretch or taking the twist. And for the next breath or two, ask yourself, you know, am I really forcing and fighting this or am I meeting the stretch about halfway, kind of relaxed way? Stretches should get more comfortable as you hold them rather than worse. If this gets worse and worse, the longer you hold it, come out of it and maybe try one of the other stretches. And now for five breaths, focus on that quality of the breath that you've chosen. At the same time, continuing to notice any sensations of stretch and release the stretch, come back to center. So before we take the second side, or if you were doing this stretch, I'm going to suggest that you uh, kind of hold on to the back of the chair and, and uh, pull your chest forward a little bit. But before we do that, tell me what you noticed about that process. Anything that stood out about that? It was easier. Easier? Than just focusing on the breath. Interesting. Tell me why. Complexity. Yes. OK, great. So the, it, was easier to, um, it was easier to focus on the breath when we were adding some movement or stretch to it than when we were just focusing on the breath. This is, I think, one of the reasons why yoga is so appealing to people, because uh, we're often moving or stretching while we're cultivating the skill of choosing the focus of our attention, that it, it's an actual embodied experience with uh, just a little bit of, of needing to do something that, that helps us hone in on our experience. What else did you notice? Did it get worse the longer you held it, or better, or the same? Same. Same or looser, yeah. Yeah, good. Often, when we first approach a stretch or a yoga pose, we do it in a way that you're really like trying to push into the stretch or resist what you're feeling, that it gets worse and worse the longer we hold it. And so what we just did, and it's great if you had the experience that it got better or didn't change, it sort of felt felt the same or felt comfortable the whole time through. Uh, this, is, this is what you're looking for in every yoga pose or every movement, and even any exercise, for those of you who do other forms of physical therapy or exercise, that the movement should get easier the more you do it, the stretch should get more comfortable the longer you hold it, and it's this focusing on the breath that is often the, the root into that experience, rather than holding the breath or tensing the breath. Um, okay, well, so let's try the other side. And if you did the back stretch, you might just turn around and show you this. You might bring your hands to the side of your chair and lean forward a little bit to try to bring some stretch into the front of the body. Yeah, and you can hold on anywhere to the chair that that feels good. And sometimes sitting a little bit more forward on the chair makes it more comfortable. So if your hips are scoot all the way back, you might come forward a little bit if you have the room. 
Okay, so now that you're in the second side or second stretch, take another breath or so to try to relax any unnecessary tension, perhaps in your face or jaw, or your shoulders or hands. Notice where you feel the stretch. What does that feel like? And then at the same time now, focus on the quality of the breath for about five more breaths. You may even notice that this stretch changes where you feel the movement of the breath. Maybe the feeling of the breath is somehow connected to the feeling of the stretch. And release. Any reports about that? Second side felt better. Felt better. Great observation. And this is, I, I think, uh, this is a demonstration of plasticity. That is, when we do something, we learn from it. And so if you do a stretch in a mindful, and a mindful way that is compassionate to your body, the body is more ready to do it again. If you do a movement or stretch in a way that is aggressive and uncomfortable, the body learns that that movement or stretch is a threat that it needs to protect you from, and the second time around is going to be worse. And this is something that you can really attend to in whatever form of exercise you're doing, or those of you who, if you go on to take yoga classes or take yoga classes now, uh, you should be looking for this basic experience that within a given session, things feel better rather than worse or over time. And that's a great sign when that's true. The one thing I want to say about this before we move into our final practice uh, is a little bit about the physiology of what we're doing with this. Um, yoga uses stretches a lot more than other types of movement. And there's not a lot of cardiovascular work. And, and you know, there's some strength work, but the emphasis often is on stretch. And the interesting thing about stretch and how the brain feels a stretch is that it's actually the pain receptors in your muscles and your skin and your joints that tell the brain when you're stretching. So it's the very same receptors uh, that can create the experience of chronic pain in the joints, the muscles, the connective tissue that are listening to stretch. And so when we learn to stretch in a way that feels safe, you're actually retraining the nervous system about how to listen to pain in the body. Most people, when they start stretching, experience stretch as pain. And that's totally normal because it's pain receptors that are reading what's happening in the joint and in the body. And so a big part of yoga for pain relief is learning how to put this little bit of stress on the tissues and joints of the body and practice not freaking out and not putting so much strain on them that it really is unsafe or, or going to injure the body. And so playing the edge like this, where you feel something, but it's not really awful pain, and staying at that spot where you feel a little something, and breathing, and knowing that the body is safe, that's a big tool for the neuroplasticity of, of sort of relearning a chronic pain response. And that's why the movement part of yoga can be so helpful. Um, OK, so the last exercise we're going to do is, I realize, well, we will definitely end by 8 o'clock. This last exercise is uh, just a reflection. So it's possible you'll want to close your eyes. If you're worried about falling asleep, keep your eyes open. And uh, if you brought something to write on or with and that appeals to you, you could even bring that out and, and maybe write down a thought or two that comes to mind here. And this is a, an exercise called listening to your body that is one of the befriending the body practices of yoga. So I want you to start by uh, remembering whatever it was you chose at the beginning of this talk as something that you're grateful for in your body. You know, I ask you to remember something that is working. Your heart is beating, you're breathing, something is going well. You're here, so probably many things are going well, even though some things may not be. Okay, so bring that to mind again, or maybe something else comes to mind. And see if, again, you can feel a kind of authentic gratitude to your body for bringing you here, for whatever is already healthy and working. Tap into that feeling of appreciation or gratitude, or just that sense that the body is a kind of heroic friend. It hasn't given up yet.
And then turn your attention to the breath again and allow yourself to feel the breath and sense the whole body. Often when we are sick or in pain, we choose to not listen to the body because the body is not telling us things we particularly want to hear. And we can run into trouble if we stop listening to the body because we don't want to hear the pain. And so just allow yourself to feel what's happening in the body, even if there is discomfort present, even if there is fatigue present. And also feel the breath. And now I'd like you to ask your body a few questions. And you can ask your body using the word you, or you can ask yourself using the word I. Ask your body, ask yourself, is there anything you need more of that I can give you? Is there anything you need that I can give you? And just pause with these questions. Sometimes the mind starts searching for the right answer. What do I need? What do I need? What do I need? Uh, Just wait and see if anything comes up. Sometimes just asking the questions is the practice. Because if you haven't been asking lately, sometimes the body needs to hear that you're listening before it starts talking. So the next question is, what do you need a break from? Goodness, what what do you need a break from? What would nourish you the best? What would nourish you the best? Is there anything you need my permission or encouragement to do again? Is there anything you need my permission and encouragement to do again? And finally, is there anything else I should know? Is there anything else I should know? And if anything came up in response to those questions, you can just make a mental note now. If there's anything that you might want to return to, maybe it's a question or maybe it's an idea. Maybe it's some good advice. And if nothing came up, trust that this practice was still useful in sending a message to the body. If your eyes are closed, now is a good time to open them. And again, one more time, you can move or stretch in any way that is needed. So this was just a little taste of the the five practices of yoga. What I'm going to do now is we're going to shift to Q&A, and I want to honor anyone who needs to leave uh, on the hour. So let's take just a minute break if anyone needs to to leave. Thank you for coming. And if any of you have questions, now is the time to formulate them. And we'll go maybe 10 minutes or so with questions if, uh, if there are that many questions, if needed. Thank you. You know, so my experience, um, I mean, I, I felt like headaches. You know, some people get tired at the end of the day, and some people get hungry. I got a headache. That was just the way the day went. Um, and I wandered into yoga for, as a way of pain relief, actually through mindfulness first, uh, through meditation. And what I found sort of most profoundly healing was actually the, the willingness to notice how it felt and not let the thoughts get so carried away that I changed my whole life to cater to the, the headache. Like, so I don't decide that I, need, I can't plan anything in the evening because I'm going to have a headache, so I can't do anything at nights. Or you know, when the headache shows up, I need to leave wherever I am and go home and protect myself from this headache. Uh, and that it actually, the, the process of breathing and being with my breath 
made the quality of the pain different. And it's hard to explain if you haven't experienced it, that you can have the physical sensation of the pain without the emotional aspect of the pain and the thoughts uh, that make the pain uh, really own your attention. Um, so without some of the emotional suffering. And so for me, that was, that was the blessing. And the headaches didn't go away. And so for me, it wasn't even the movement or anything like that. It was just this idea of how to attend to, um, to sensation differently. And I think that that can be something that's useful for everyone. So even if you were to never go to a yoga class, but the, you know, the next time that you have a particularly strong pain episode or notice discomfort, if you choose to turn your attention to it, and use maybe one of the breathing visualizations that we did, or just even say the word inhale, exhale, that process, doing that regularly, is helpful for, for just about everyone and every type of pain. And then um, with, with other types of pain, uh, for example, I mentioned back pain. For many people with chronic back pain or chronic joint pain, it's very tied to stress. Stress triggers the muscle tension, it increases inflammation that's gonna make you more sensitive to pain, it can lead to postures that reinforce the pain. And so for many people, uh, finding a version of yoga that reduces their stress, it could be power yoga, it could be lying down and taking a yoga nap, which is a formal yoga practice, yoga nidra. Um, and so you, know, you mentioned how to apply it to the individual. It may be that there's going to be sort of one yoga practice that is really healing for you. Uh, and you know, when I work with people, I encourage them to try a whole bunch of practices. And in the book, you know, there's practices uh, from all the five categories that I mentioned, practices that are strenuous and restful, practices that are kind of strengthening and protective, both for the mind and the body, and also practices that are just a gift, just a moment of, of relief. And so you know, while I can't say what exactly is gonna end up being the most useful for your headache or your back pain, it's this process of trying out different things and trusting. Trusting whatever it is that in that moment makes you feel a little more comfortable or makes you feel a little more courageous or reduces your stress. Acupuncture, I, um, I'm a big fan of acupuncture because like yoga, it has a good evidence base and people have some ideas about the mechanisms by which it works. So I'm, I'm not an acupuncturist. I don't know a whole lot about it. All I'll say is that, uh, that there's a lot of evidence that it works and some of the mechanisms it seems to work on include stress relief and encouraging the, the brain to release uh, endogenous opioids that, that help take the edge off of pain. And when you can take, so it's like taking your own little pain medication with less side effects. And that's just one of probably one of the mechanisms that acupuncture works by. Um, but when, when the body, uh, when the brain releases those chemicals, uh, the whole nervous system gets less less sensitive to pain, and is listening less for pain. And there's evidence that yoga does the same thing, that or any form of gentle exercise and movement uh, increases endogenous opioids in the brain and some other neurotransmitters that improve mood. So uh, you know, if you use it, I think it's very complementary. So let me sum up, so especially since this is for the webcast. So you describe the pain process very well that often what happens is there's something going on in the body like inflammation, inflammatory chemicals that your pain receptors will hear. They send a message to your brain. And many pain medications, not all, but many work by making the brain unable to really listen to what's happening in the body. And you know, some medications will, will actually correct inflammation, but many times we're just trying to block the listening part. Uh, so in that way, you know, pain medications often are not the, the, the best long-term solution. Uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and yet sometimes when we're really busy with life, we find that the brain kind of stops listening on its own. Uh, and the, it works in a, in a similar way in that when something else captures your attention and it's really compelling, or it could be uh, something that you find funny or something that brings you joy, uh, often the brain can just on its own put the, the pain on the back burner and stop listening as much. Um, and that's a kind of healthy distraction. Uh, there's a lot of research that trying to distract yourself doesn't work. But you can, you can distract yourself by putting your attention on something positive. There's actually a lot of research on this, how, how, how the trying to distract yourself while you're feeling pain doesn't work. Uh, and that's when mindfulness actually is more useful. But if you're going about your life, you're essentially sending a message to your brain that says, actually, I'm safe. 
So it's the, it's the choice to not um, limit your activities that actually allows the brain and the nervous system to feel a little bit safer. And so it's not listening as much. And this is, the, you know, this is why avoidance is such a, uh, an unhelpful strategy for chronic pain, of trying to make your life narrower and narrower to avoid things that would make the pain worse. Because that often is sending a very compelling message to your whole system that you aren't safe. Uh, and it has nothing else to do except listen for the evidence. Um, and so choosing to kind of reapproach things in your life in a mindful way, you know, noticing if it really does make things worse, but often it doesn't make things worse, and you can sort of rebuild your life out in that way. Yeah, so this, so this is the observation that in doing, uh, well, so first this observation that sometimes when we go to exercise classes or yoga classes, the setup is not exactly what I've been talking about. It's more like push, do it harder, do it more, or there's so much that you have a hard time keeping up, and now we're doing something different, and wait, I didn't know what we were doing before, and it's already changed. There's not necessarily an opportunity to be mindful. And so for that reason, one thing I encourage you to do if you don't practice yoga is to be very thoughtful when you walk into a class about whether this is consistent with the things you heard tonight or whether this is one of those other yoga classes. Um, and you're, you're really looking for a class that is mindful and slow enough to, to be with your body in a compassionate way rather than feeling like another way to sort of beat yourself up about how you're not flexible enough or not strong enough or whatever other forms of self-beating can sometimes happen. Okay, so that part, thank you for, say, for saying that. Uh, the second observation is that sometimes one side of the body is very different than the other side of the body. One side is more flexible or one side resists a little bit more. And is that, is that a sign? What does that mean? Yeah, it means, so this is true for all of us. And often we have asymmetry in where we hold tension in the body. We have different histories. You may have had an injury on one shoulder and not the other. You may do a lot of things in your life with one side of your body using it and not as much the other. And so there's nothing sort of automatically wrong. Often the mind goes to trying to diagnose, thinking like, oh no, this is a sign that something is wrong with me. And so taking the, the point of view of befriending the body, you know, the first thing to do when you notice that is uh, allow that to be true without feeling like there's now the side of your body that is the wrong side or the bad side that needs to now become as good as the other side. Uh, and just even noticing the tendency that we have to want to try to make that side like the other side, sort of you know, get it along with the program. So noticing that can be the first step of befriending the body. And then what I often suggest to people is when you notice one side is a little bit more challenging than the other, do that side twice but do it in a way that feels as comfortable as possible. And think of the stretch or the pose as kind of a gift to that side of the body. And uh, to try to be really mindful about whether it's just resisting a little bit, like it can't go as far, or it's, it's just not as comfortable, versus this is actually making it worse, and the longer I hold it, the worse it feels. If it's the latter, then you know it's not the movement for the body in this moment. Yeah. So one of the things, I, I personally find that listening to someone talk is very helpful. So one thing I did is on my website, which is the name of the book, it's yogaforpainrelief.com. If you go to resources for people with pain, there's a whole bunch of audio practices, breathing exercises, meditation exercises, relaxation exercises, because I'm the same way. Like, reading it is good, but to have a little guide is so helpful. So you can go to that website and download or stream a lot of different audio practices. Um, it, the reason that I wrote the book is because I felt like there were a lot of ideas that if you, if you don't have as the foundation for your yoga practice, it's so easy to do yoga in a way that is not healing. And so from my point of view, you can actually learn a lot of things from the book. You know, it's got pictures of poses and sequences and that kind of thing. But even if you're someone who can't, who can't learn well from the book in that way, uh, there's still a lot of ideas. The, you know, the science and the philosophy and stories stories about how people are helped with pain. So in that way, it might be useful. But then I always recommend people also find a, a class or a teacher or a community. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested, I brought free passes for Avalon Yoga Studio, which is in Palo Alto. Unfortunately, I don't teach in Redwood City, so I don't have any free passes for Redwood City. But uh, if you're willing to go to Palo Alto, uh, they have some good classes, some good gentle classes. And if you're looking for a first class anywhere, you want to look for something that's called gentle, beginners, mindful, or slow, or restorative. Those are kind of like the key words to look for. I usually recommend people don't start with power, vinyasa, <laughs> flow, or hot yoga. 
Uh, not as a starting point. Sometimes people find that that actually ends up being very possible and very healing, but you don't want your first experience in a yoga studio to be a failure where you hurt worse afterwards than when you, when you began. So be willing to ask, you know, call and say, what is the, the easiest class you have that gives the best chance for a beginner to feel really good when they leave the class, not, not worse? Um, so those are some things I would recommend. And also the book has uh, some recommendations for DVDs. And if anyone is looking for a DVD, there's just the first one I would recommend is uh, called Yoga Therapy for Back Pain and Yoga Therapy for the Upper Body by Gary Kraftsau. And if you want to write that down, you can just go over there to a copy of the book and look, look it up in the back. But those DVDs are by far the best for beginners. The question is, uh, what if I need someone to teach one-on-one? -on -one? Um, I usually send people who, are, who want one-on-one -on -one instruction to an organization called the International Organization of Yoga Therapists, um, because those are yoga teachers who are very highly trained, more trained than the ones who, who might be at the gym or even the local yoga studio. Uh, and they're all people who offer yoga one-on-one. -on -one. And you can choose them, like I also want one who's an MD or a physical therapist or a psychologist or something like that. So if you're, and I'm sure that there are some folks around uh, the Redwood City area, um, that's iayt.org, and they have a, a find a yoga therapist search. And I can also pass on my contact information. Uh, I, know, I know some teachers in Redwood City. Thank you very much.